We have been and we will be talking a lot about the mad power struggle going on uh, to take the, essentially in my opinion, to take the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau away from the people. Uh, it is the people who created it. And uh, here to talk about that with us now, we haven't talked to her for a while, so it's good to have her back on the show, is Alexis Goldstein. Alexis is a senior policy analyst at Americans for Financial Reform. I've admired her work since back in the Occupy days when she was a co-author of uh, Occupy the SEC's comment, later, comment letter urging a strong Volcker rule in, uh, in, uh, in Dodd-Frank and other legislation. And I'm sure, I know she has some thoughts on this. She, like me, is a veteran of the Wall Street world. Uh, and somewhere, I guess, along the way, we went right or something. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Alexis, thanks for coming back on the program. RJ, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Mick Mulvaney, what's your take? I mean, in the past few days, we've seen Trump appoint uh, his budget director to a dual position as also CFPB director, a guy who said he wanted it uh, wanted to get rid of it altogether when he was in Congress, said terrible things about it. Uh, then we had Richard Cordray, the director, uh, appoint an assistant director who claimed the title as of acting director. Courts have now at least temporarily ruled that Mulvaney's in charge. What do you make of all that? So I guess just to take a step back, so when Director Cordray resigned, um, and it is worth just taking a minute to praise Director Cordray's work, or former director, I should say, that this is an agency that's returned over $12 billion to 29 million people. And this is money that's not often big amounts of money. It's like, say your bank rips you off for 30 bucks because they reorder your payments in a weird way. You can, you know, try to get your money back, but often they're going to argue with you or put you on hold for two hours and then hang up with you at the end. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is a place you can go and complain about that, and then they'll reach out to your bank and try to fight on your behalf. You can do that at consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. So, so Richard Cordray resigns. He says, Leandra English is the new deputy director, and the law that created the Consumer Bureau says that if there's no current director, the deputy director becomes the acting director. So that's how Leandra English became, in my opinion, the legitimate acting director, because that's what Dodd-Frank says, and that's the, that is the law. And then Trump comes, and he appoints Mick Mulvaney, which, as you mentioned, already has a job um, and is certainly no friend of the CFPB. He's called it a sad, sick joke. He's voted to try to take away its independent funding. Um, and there's sort of a legal battle going on, as you alluded to. Leandra English has filed for a temporary restraining order to prevent Mulvaney from from coming in, um, that was not successful, but that was an emergency order. That court case is very much still ongoing. I, I anticipate that we're going to see an appeal. The battle is ongoing. But right now the Bureau basically has two people who are who both say that they're the acting director. In my opinion, Ms. English is the legitimate one. Um, and so it's a confusing time. It reminds me, I don't know if your listeners know that movie, Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome, Two Men Enter, What man leaves or one person leaves but it's certainly a chaotic situation and it's really not good for the people right this is an agency that's important that's important that it keep working yeah well i guess in in the mad max beyond thunderdome analogy trump is what he's tina turner right yeah i guess he's tina turner <laughs> yeah he's like the master of ceremonies in there <laughs> yeah um so I'm glad uh, I'm glad uh, to hear you reiterate that the trial or, or the court case rather, excuse me, is ongoing, because I also uh, am strongly of the belief that Ms. English is the legitimate director. But as of now, uh, I believe that she's she's not showing up there, right? She's not issuing orders or anything like that, or is she? Um, I'm not sure what she's doing day to day. I know that she's meeting with a number of senators. We've, uh, there are a number of senators who have tweeted photos of meeting with her. Um, I know she sent a sort of, hey, how's everyone going? Have you had a happy Thanksgiving email? Mulvaney, I know, has told people to ignore her, um, but I don't know that that's stopping her from, from doing her work. Um, but it's certainly a, a, an awkward situation, a strange situation, and I think it's going to come to the courts to sort of sort this out, right? 
there are still injunctions, hearings on the merits, appeals, all of that. But um, Mick Mulvaney has tried to put in place a 30-day hiring freeze, and he has also tried to stop um, dispersal of refunds to consumers who have been wronged, and he's trying to stop um, – so the CFPB does a lot of things in addition to taking complaints. They take enforcement actions against financial firms when they scam us. And so he's trying to essentially freeze a whole host of, of pending enforcement actions. There's 38 pending enforcement actions. Um, and so he's trying to freeze that. And so he's really trying to gut the Bureau from within. Um, and I think it's up to the courts to decide whether or not he will be successful doing that. Yeah, and again, we're talking with Alexis Goldstein of Americans for Financial Reform. And Alexis, it seems to me that, first of all, if you're coming from the attitude of basically the appetite for destruction that Mick Mulvaney has for uh, the CFPB, I guess it's not a full-time job. I guess he can do his other job, too, because... All he has to do is go over there and say, you can't do anything. You can't give people the money back that the banks stole from them. You can't punish the banks for their proven wrongdoing. You can't issue new rules to protect the American people from predatory bankers. Basically, you can't function. He can do that uh, you know, over coffee in the morning, and then he can and go do his other job. Um, but it seems to me like it is what Mulvaney and Trump are, and the Republicans, is a, because they all have been you know, engaging in a war to destroy the CFPB since its creation, it seems to me that what they're doing is so naked in this case that they are so openly trying to make sure that the banks aren't held accountable and that people who have been ripped off don't get any of their money back. I think you're exactly right, and I think Donald Trump himself gave away the game when he tweeted about the Consumer Bureau over Thanksgiving weekend, and he was you know, saying that he didn't talk about consumers, he didn't talk about Americans who got scammed. What he said when he tweeted was, financial institutions have been devastated because of the CFPB. So his concern is clearly not us. His concern is the banks. And I don't think it's fair to say that you've devastated an institution by preventing them from stealing money from us, right? Like preventing people from breaking the law is not devastating, especially when you're a big, powerful bank that has, you know, made more profits this year than they have in a really long time. But yeah, I think he uh, he keeps saying the quiet part out loud, as people like to say. Right. Um, but yeah, I think and Mulvaney too has been very naked about his ambition to to gut the CFPB's funding. He voted when he was a member of the House a number of times to, for example, um, we've known for a really long time that there's a lot of racial discrimination in car loans. Um, there's a lot of discrimination, period. If you try to go and get a, an auto loan, like if you're single, you'll get a worse rate than if you're married. You know, if you're black, you'll get a worse white rate than if you're white. And the CFPB tried to issue some guidance to try to make sure that the auto dealers weren't doing that. And there was some legislation in Congress to block that. Mick Mulvaney voted for that. So he is a longtime foe of this agency, a longtime foe of holding banks and financial institutions accountable. And uh, it just reminds me of Scott Pruitt at the EPA. It's who is the worst person we can, we can pick to try to destroy this agency from within. Yeah, and you know, I, I've got to say, when I, I look at the records of uh, Pruitt, or in this case, uh, Mick Mulvaney, you know, I, I live now in Washington, D.C., where the culture is, you know, my good friend across the aisle. But I just, I mean, this personal observation that you could comment on or not, but I just look at these people and I say, you know, these are not good human beings. These are not good people. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know what, Mulvaney is or isn't like as a person. I just know that his politics and his his positions in the past have been very anti-consumer, like anti-consumer, and then very pro-bank. Um, he has consistently voted. If there was a vote to release the rules on Wall Street, he voted for it. And if there was a a vote to restrain the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, he voted for that too. And so I think his politics have been terrible, and his positions have been terrible, and he is not a friend to this agency. Um, right. And I am very concerned about what will happen to this agency that has done so many things 
and so much good for people. And it doesn't just do enforcement actions, and it doesn't just get your money back when the bank steals it from you. They also put out information, and they have a right. whole section on education and helping people understand and navigate their really complicated student loan process. And here's some tips and tricks about how you might be able to lower your student loan repayment. So there's tons of things that this bureau does. Um, and if he slows it down, there's just going to be a lot a lot less good information out there in addition to a lot less prosecutions of banks stealing our money and a lot less people getting their money back. And that's a tragedy. Yeah, it is a tragedy. And all right, maybe he's a wonderful man in his private life. But, um, <laughs> yeah, and, I don't know. <laughs> and by the way, to your point about uh, the president's tweet that financial institutions have been devastated, I did a little research when I read that myself. CFPB began, what, five and a half years ago? Over the last five years, Bank of America stock up 180%, J.P. Morgan Chase up 145%, Citigroup up more than 109%, and on and on and on. So I don't think there's a lot of wreckage there that he can really point to. Um, so where do you? Uh, where and do he's, you... he's the one that brags about the stock market all the time, right? So which you have to pick one, right? <laughs> Either banks are doing great, and you get to brag about the stock market going up, and bank stocks going up, or or they're not devastated, but he wants to have it both ways. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, no, you're absolutely right. And I think we shouldn't give Trump or the Republicans a free pass on this. You know, I mean, I always worry that it's a constant theme of mine that, you know, we make it all about how horrible Trump is. Well, you know, the whole party's really, really uh, been pushing, I think of Spencer Backus, you know, the former chairman of the House Financial Services Committee saying, you know, he tried to take it back later, but I, you know, I believe that Washington is here to serve the banks. Um, mm. So we have, well, how do we, uh, let me change the subject a little bit, uh, or the focus a little bit, Alexis Goldstein, how do we fight back uh, you know, it, it, it can be discouraging and daunting, right? Because the Republicans have all three branches of the federal government. Uh, Trump is appointing these, uh, you know, politically horrific, although they may be, may be personally lovely people to these positions. And it, it, what do people do? Uh, how do we keep our spirits up and then, you know, resist this stuff? Well, I think this is a – I'm sure you're going to be talking or have already talked about the, the tax bill on this show. I mean, hopefully folks are engaged in calling members' offices about that. And so when you do that and when you make your calls about that, you can also say – I support the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's the kind of thing that they don't hear as much because it's sort of a lower volume issue because we have so much chaos going on and so many issues to care about. Um, so you can obviously make it clear to your senator, to your representative that this is important. I also think that there, you can do a lot at the state level if you know you, you've done your work at the federal level. One of the cool things that the Consumer Bureau did is they, they have an office of the Student Loan Ombudsman. And this is an office that puts out reports. This is an office that tries to help people who have student loan complaints. And there's a couple states that have actually created student loan ombudsmen at the state level. And they serve a similar purpose. And they try to help people in the state who are having trouble. And so if your state doesn't have one, you could maybe push at the local level to, to get one. And that's obviously a lot easier than making change at the federal level. But the Consumer Bureau has provided this nice model for us about what an office like that might do. And so that that's something that I always suggest doing cuz you know your local your local representative gets way less calls than your federal one does and so you can really have an impact there. So those are those are two things that I would mention and I really think that um, Obviously, if you, if you want to, you know, my organization, uh, we're at ourfinancialsecurity.org. We send out alerts all the time. So if you want to plug in, you can check us out that way. But I really, I really do think that we can take the good at the federal level and try to mimic it at the local level in the meantime. All right. Well, thanks a lot for your insights on this topic. Uh, Alexis Goldstein of Americans for Financial Reform, good to talk to you again. And thanks for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me.